a good afternoon to everyone. So welcome to the third workshop in this series, The Academic Libraries Reimagined, which is created since last year to foster knowledge sharing within the librarian communities and anyone who might be interested in the topics that's presented. So before we get started, um, there is a couple of house rules for the session. Um, you might notice that your audio and video has been turned off. So for any questions, feel free to type it into the chat box at any time, and then we will address them at the end of the presentation. This whole session will be recorded, so you will have a copy of um, the slides and also the link to the videos after the event via email. And if there is any questions that is not answered during the webinar, please email them um, to the marketing apac at thegoiter.com. And of course, feel free to share all these resources with your colleagues. So without further ado, um, we have with us today, the university librarian, Philip Ken from University of Sydney to touch on the topic, developing library professionals and libraries as learning organizations. Um, and also a tip that, you know, do stay with us till the end where I will share more information on the next sessions happening in May. So with that, I will now pass on to Philip um, to start the presentation. Good. So thank you very much, Lavinia. And uh, we can move to the next slide. So I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Gadi, uh, which are in the uh, inner city of Sydney today. Uh, and uh, they are the traditional owners of these lands. And I'd like to acknowledge their great care for this land that uh, I'm meeting you today from. And uh, I'd like to pay my respects to, to them to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and thank them for the, the wonderful care of this beautiful country. It's uh, been uh, quite rainy here um, on Gaddy Land today, and uh, it's um, fresh and clean, the country that we were, I'm joining you from. So we move to the next slide, and I'd just like to say uh, that uh, today I will give you um, a very brief background on my institution, the University of Sydney. And that's because although we have a good number of Australians joining, uh, we have um, a, a very good number of people from other ASEAN nations here today. So welcome to you all. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my university. Then I'm going to recap on um, many trends that have already changed library work in the past 10 years. Then I'll touch on the impact of, of the COVID-19 pandemic on our operations. And then I'll posit some thoughts about the library workforce of the future. And then we'll have hopefully plenty of time I've planned to take your questions and also your views on this um, interesting topic. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, we've jumped one back here. Thank you. So the University of Sydney is Australia's first university. So it has a long history and reputation. And while views vary on the efficacy of uh, rankings, uh, we rank highly in Australia and the world. We're a cos com composite university teaching and researching in almost all disciplines. Like other large research intensive universities, we have large student and staff numbers. Next slide, please. Since 1850, Sydney has been the home to a large number of libraries. Over time, many have been consolidated into fewer larger libraries and small discipline libraries have been replaced by vibrant learning hubs across our campuses. We have one of the largest staff numbers and cost 
in Australian university libraries. Not surprisingly, due to our age, we are reputed to have the largest library collection in Australia, and some say in the Southern Hemisphere. We are a scholarly university with many study seats, and our popularity extends to large number of, of visits each year. While print collections are still important in universities like ours, the majority of our expenditure is on electronic resources and they are very well used. Next slide, please. Automation and self-service have been a game changer. Uh, yeah, thanks. Have been a game changer for libraries. Our high numbers of records and transactions led to early automation of catalogues, loans, and services. Online collections meant we could serve our communities 24 seven without having to open doors. This has reaped enormous savings and efficiencies. Academics have told me that they could complete the research for their PhDs in the same number of months as the years that they invested. So like airlines, banks and utilities, we are open for business at all hours and self-service has reduced our need for transactional staff over time. Next slide, please. The notion of students as customers has changed the way we do business. When I was an undergraduate, we were treated like a slightly older version of school students. However, today we have a much stronger focus on customers. Customer service skills require a different skill set and approach. Our staff provide more value added help instead of transactional work. And this has led to higher levels of staffing in terms of their um, skills and their salaries. Services such as Library Chat have grown in popularity and effectiveness. An increased focus on the student's experience has required new skill sets and led to new roles such as student rovers, peer learning advisors, study skills specialists, and even event coordinators. Many libraries have increased the number of part-time students as staff, and there has also been a growth in maker spaces or technology hubs within our library services. And at Sydney, our exam ready program is one of the star offerings requiring different skills and approach. Next slide, please. A renewed focus on library as place has led to 24 seven opening with an absence of library staff and a greater reliance on security staff. Many library staff prefer not to work antisocial hours and we have experienced very few incidents in our spaces after hours for many years now. We have created beautiful and inspirational learning spaces, skills rarely required of our library ancestors. Next slide, please. Librarians have always contributed to the research process, but in the past 10 years, this has become a real area of growth. Our research skills can assist at every step in the research life cycle. We celebrate our successes when library work on publication lists help a scholar win a research grant or an acclaimed fellowship. We have extended our work and skill sets into research data management, GIS expertise, digital humanities, citation analysis and research assessment. Next slide, please. Sydney's most valuable rare book is the first edition of Newton's Principia. 
However, many younger universities have also developed rare or special collections, often to celebrate and support niche areas of research expertise. Regional universities often become a safe home for collections that relate to the history and character of local communities. As our journal packages have become ubiquitous across most universities, university librarians have become the custodian of corporate memory and experts in digitization. Next slide, please. Not only do we collect a broader range of materials, they are worthless if locked away. Public events, exhibitions to support academic programs and programs for school children are areas of growth that previously were the purview of state and public libraries only. These images come from my previous role at the University of Bristol in the UK, where we planned gallery spaces, teaching rooms, event facilities and cafes in our plans for a new university library. The concept of community engagement and the civic university requires active public programs, often with a widening participation agenda that are as important as the spaces themselves. Next slide, please. Against the background, this background of change that I have described in library work, Sconnell, the peak group for academic librarians, commissioned this report that appeared at the end of 2017. Next slide. In a more scholarly way than my earlier observations, this report highlighted other developments and trends in library services. Work associated with datafied scholarship, connected learning and service oriented libraries require different skills and approaches. Next slide, please. This also results in changing boundaries between professions and groups and it is not so much what you do, but how you do it that counts. This report also highlighted a highly volatile higher education sector with political and economic pressures that challenge the nature and mission of our universities in the 21st century. Next slide. Surveys of librarians within Sconnell membership institutions paint a picture of anticipated future skills. Now these predictions were made five years ago now. And so if valid, we might expect to see some of these changes in five years or less. COVID may have accelerated some of these as well. It is encouraging that the respondents, and these were grassroots librarians across the sector, thought our values and skills would remain relevant and that library roles would be more diverse and specialist. However, they also predicted that library qualifications will be less important there will be fewer librarian jobs and librarians will work outside traditional library departments. I wonder if these will become true. Next slide. So with that background, fast forward to the last two years and COVID-19. Due to the global pandemic, we have all scaled down and up our services, been innovative in providing retrieval and postal services, escalated our online chat services, 
pushed our online collections and services to the limit and helped to reset the clock in some institutions where print was still highly valued. Almost all libraries suffered funding reductions, primarily due to loss of international student numbers. These reductions were in staffing or collections, our two major levers. All Australian university libraries had to respond in some way with a mix of voluntary and involuntary redundancies, recruitment freezes, collection cuts, and other austerity measures as a result of reduced university income. We have all redefined our business and services as a result. We have been making the most of our workforce, redefining jobs, in some cases, less specialization, sharing around the most immediate work, for example, digitization instead of shelving. Work also changed to initiate click and collect services or postal loans. Pre-COVID in the UK, some institutions suffered budget cuts linked to their reduction in enrolments. One colleague had to mainstream most of her remaining posts. Specialisations were curtailed and essentially everyone had to lend a hand to the most urgent priorities. Next slide. We became experts in instituting change at short notice, implementing rules and public health measures, reducing seating, policing mask wearing, completing COVID safe plans and risk assessments, consulting with staff, checking on well-being, and becoming experts on Zoom meetings and collaborating via Teams. Our new service that was highly valued in public libraries was their phone calls to elderly patrons who were lonely at home and dropping off books on their doorstep. What was a new skill or work responsibility that you had to learn during COVID? Let's take a moment to share a, just a word or two in the chat function if you would like to. Closed archives worldwide and the inability of academics to take sabbaticals to visit specialist collections was a huge interruption to the research process. Both Melbourne and Sydney universities are participating in an international virtual reading room project to enable academics to browse and obtain digital copies of primary source materials. Some have suggested a new gig economy whereby people could visit archives, take pics of primary sources and upload them to clients worldwide. Perhaps this is a new job for graduate students instead of driving Uber. We want to take forward the innovations from our COVID experience and where job allow, jobs allow, also continue to explore opportunities to work from home while balancing team dynamics. Next slide. So I have raised evidence of changes that have already taken in our profession over the past 10 years or so. I've also highlighted the changes to our services, operations and facilities necessitated by COVID or maybe just helped along by COVID and actioned by innovation and in some cases necessity. I often reflect on this image 
from the iconic 1957 film called Desk Set that portrays the classic reference librarian and pits her against an early computer. Apart from the romance of the film and its evocative recreation of that era, it helps me contemplate the past and the future. What will remain in our professional toolkit? Will we adapt, change, or become redundant because of technology? So next slide. There are many ways to approach this conundrum. While we know the future is hard to be sure about, particularly regarding requisite roles, COVID dictated the settings and determined the rules of engagement for library work over the past two years. It is likely that we will continue to need deep expertise in some areas and also to require specialist still skills. Libraries increasingly provide employment for non-librarians or technicians. HR, finance, IT, marketing, and event management skills are often sourced from specialists, or sometimes librarians turn this, their hands to such roles. The Sconnell survey results suggested less reliance on formal library skills. What does that mean for library schools in vocational education and universities? Where do micro credentials fit? No doubt flexibility will be important. Next slide. Uncertainty about the economic future led the University of Sydney to conduct a voluntary redundancy program in 2021. Although we said goodbye to valued colleagues, we were fortunate that the university agreed to create new modern roles that met the changing needs of our service. I'm delighted to report that most of these new jobs were filled by internal staff who demonstrated adaptability and suitability for different roles. Next slide. Trish Hepworth, Director of Policy and Education at the Australian Library and Information Association, recently observed that, quote, core values and ethics are critical in shaping professional development and skills for the future. Now more than ever, these professional values are perhaps more important than knowing a particular program or type of library work. Next slide. So these 10 professional values on these two slides summarize the breadth of our profession and should be the bedrock upon which specific roles are built in the future. Next slide. Alia's Professional Pathways Initiative is a three-year project to strengthen the profession, increase diversity, and help create a future ready workforce. The project has a vision to deliver a strong, diverse, and future ready workforce with contemporary skills that ensures the quality of library and information services across Australia. Pathways into library work may be possible from, for those from other professions or careers. The Council of Australian University Librarians has a senior leader development and networking project to reimagine calls leadership development and capacity building activities with a focus on senior leaders. The project has investigated international benchmarks and will shortly make recommendations to the ALIA board on leadership development, leader networking and leadership awards for senior Australian and Aotearoa New Zealand 
university library staff. The project team will undertake the following key activities. Sorry, I've uh, something's gone wrong with my my notes, uh, so um, I'll skip that. So next slide. So although my presentation today has focused mostly on individual roles, skills and expertise, it is important to remember that teams and working together is crucial. I expect that after two years with substantial time spent working from home and on Zoom and team sessions, we will, need, we will need to refresh our team skills and to enhance performance. Next slide. The slide sets which uh, will be available uh, from De Gruyter uh, do include, uh, and we move to the next slide as well, and also another one after that, uh, they do include a number of references for you to follow up for further reading if required. So next slide is my last one. And I really wanted to use this session as much as possible. I've asked lots of questions, given you a little bit of, of information and some, uh, some work that's happening and in progress. And I'd just like to say um, thank you. And I look forward to your contribution um, through um, this next part of the session where we'll focus on your ideas and your questions. This is an exciting uh, but challenging topic with no easy answers. However, I'm confident that we will continue to adapt and innovate to the benefit of our institutions and profession. Libraries have done it throughout history and we will continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. So feel free to post um, your questions in the chat box. And while we are waiting, uh, I'm just gonna read off some of the responses to the questions that you asked earlier. So some of the new um, skills um, uh, that they have to adapt during the pandemic was things like online meeting skills, sharing a screen online, becoming generalist and reduce specialist work for subject librarians, a uh, couple of remote working comments and conducting library tasks from home. Um, using SharePoint, Zoom, etc., which is pretty new to some of them, and being expensively involved in lip chat. So I'm just going to give a couple of minutes for the attendees to type the questions. And meanwhile, I will share um, the upcoming webinars that you can look forward to. While you're doing that, I can also uh, add to uh, those um, great ideas that came in from uh, those attending the session today. I think uh, the other one is uh, respectfully telling our colleagues to unmute themselves. <laughs> is another new skill. So our upcoming uh, webinar will be happening on the 19th of May. And then the topic that we'll be talking on is space planning in the new normal, uh, which will be um, touched on by Ms. Caroline Williams, um, the university librarian at University of Queensland. And sorry, that's a typo there, my mistake and Mr. Foster Zhang, who is the Library Director at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Guangzhou Campus. So if you're interested in this topic, do remember to sign up through the registration link, which will be included in the email that will be sent out after this event. 
So let's go back um, to the questions. Right, so we do have a couple coming in. Right, so the first one is how did staff reductions influence your operational needs? Do you have to, many restructuring to do? Uh, uh, there's some echoing yeah. happening. No. Is there something you can't hear it at your end? No? Okay, good. I'll just press on. Um, yes, look, obviously, when you lose valued colleagues, uh, you do need to restructure, you need to, you can't push the work on to other people, you need to work out different ways, um, smarter ways of, of uh, doing the work, etc. And sometimes that also leads to, um, to different um, restructuring options. Um, we didn't have any major restructuring. We were, in some cases, teams just became smaller and a bit of uh, rebalancing, uh, but we were fortunate that, um, that we were able to, to manage the process reasonably well. Uh, the second half of the question, Lavinia? Um, well, I think you answered that as well. The second yeah. half was just asking if there is a major restructuring going on. All right, okay. Thanks. Okay. The next question is, do you think that physical collection still have a place in the COVID world? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think as I suggested with some of those examples about the growth of um, corporate memory collections and, um, you know, rare books and special collections, things that people can use for research um, are, you know, growing. Uh, they're a new, you know, a new line of business for some university libraries and a growing um, component for some of the older libraries that have had them for some time. But um, I think, you know, I think this tension between online and uh, print um, certainly uh, was um, a bigger tension before COVID but it was really through our ability to deliver so much online that, you know, universities were able to continue to do their work. And, uh, you know, particularly a lot of the, um, you know, information resources staff all around the world really came, and publishers, of course, who extended access, uh, but also, you know, the ability to get so much in information online uh, really has been a game changer. And I guess what I was trying to say is that those people that were perhaps online hesitant uh, in the past um, perhaps have seen the benefits of online and perhaps changed their views. But, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a book hater, so um, I, you know, I, I don't think it's either or anyway. Um, someone's mentioning that um, she's a young librarian with five year experience. So what are some of the most important skills that um, they will need for co career longevity in the library industry? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you for that one. Um, look, I think as I was hinting uh, a couple of times in my presentation, Perhaps what's more important than having a particular skill or knowing how to use a particular system or software, uh, you know, librarians are smart and they can learn those things and, and learn new ones as they keep changing over time. But I think some of those issues like flexibility, adaptability, eagerness to learn new things. You know, librarians like Desk Set, that 1957 film, librarians are in, have always been inquisitive and they've always sought out and learnt new things. I think, you know, one of the my problems, and I think it's typical of a lot of my colleagues, is that everything that we touch and see, I think, oh, wow, that's amazing. And then I want to know more about that as well. So um, I think, um, yes, obviously do things and, and keep up to date with professional development and those sorts of things. 
but also, you know, learn how to be adaptable and flexible and, you know, how to take care of yourself and work with other people in your teams and to take care of them and to, you know, all those dynamics of teamwork are absolutely important. The next question can be open to the floor, but I guess from the University of Sydney point of view, how has um, your team approached professional development in the digital environment? Ah, well, yes. Um, and, you know, a lot of our people were able, because they had a bit more time on their hands uh, during COVID, you know, everyone, you know, saved time in commuting and, you know, getting to meetings and, and those sorts of things. And, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that so many of my colleagues were able to do courses online um, that, you know, and I, I similarly was able to do more. And I think, you know, there's also, you know, some compulsory courses that we're required to do within the university. And, you know, the library is always pretty good corporate citizen anyway. Uh, but, you know, I think more people um, did those online. Uh, we, we, we've had things like mini MBAs and all sorts of things. We're, we're extremely lucky at Sydney because we have um, a, a long-standing gift from one of my university librarian predecessors, and uh, he has made um, uh, a, a large sum of money available for professional development in addition to the money that we have through the university. And so, you know, some of my colleagues have been able to take advantage of getting fees, half paid, you know, those sorts of things for really amazing courses that, you know, obviously have been delivered online over the last two years. Um, there's two parts to this question. Do you see the need for qualifications? And how do you see the future of subject specialists? Uh, very good question. Um, so qualifications, I think, are absolutely vital. And, uh, you know, it, it, the library schools, in, certainly in this country, I'm unsure about the rest of, of the ASEAN nations, but, uh, you know, they've done an amazing job you know, over the years, and there has always been um, a standard, um, you know, so it's not just courses being offered, but there's all those courses have been reviewed. And I've been fortunate to be on a number of those um, reviews, and seen how um, those courses have been conducted, you know, we interviewed students, and, um, you know, made sure that the quality aspects were there. And, you know, I know that this is, um, uh, you know, a bit of a vexing subject and it's a chicken and egg that there's, you know, not a lot of courses left. Um, and, you know, that's really unfortunate because we need a, a vibrant um, library um, education profession. And, um, you know, to some extent, I think some of the opportunities in the future around um, offering micro credentials, um, short courses, those things uh, really, uh, you know, library schools, um, particularly in the UK, I saw that the library schools were able to, to pick up that, that additional work and to bring in extra revenue, which has helped, um, you know, their, their departments uh, financially. Looking back on the last two years, what are the services or tasks that your library has stopped doing due to the loss of staff and skills? I don't know that we've stopped doing things due to the loss of staff and skills. In some respects, we've started doing some new things and that's why I shared some of those. And it was just the job titles to, um, you know, give you a, a bit of an idea about the types of jobs that, you know, are new. And some of them are not new. <laughs> in, they're new for this university, but they're not new in the sector. Um, but uh, I, we've, we've stopped things more because, you know, there's, they, they've not been required. 
or we've scaled back because uh, you know we've had facilities closed uh, rather than because we haven't had staff skills to do them. I mean, that little example I gave was that obviously with loans not happening so much because people can't come in and, and, and borrow books, um, that uh, the alternative was so that we had a growth in the need for digitization. So I apologize for the, um, the background noise. It's a public announcement about reminding people to wear their masks. So very appropriate for a session that's focusing on COVID. Okay. Uh, one last um, question, but it's more like a comment where they said that there is quite an overwhelming range of professional development um, staff being offered at the moment. So uh, it's quite difficult to choose uh, what to attend. Do you have any um, recommendation how to actually start doing that? Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded um, of a conversation. I mean, these things go in waves. And so maybe it might be helpful for you to tell you a little story. Um, people of my age who were um, hoping to progress in our career um, spent time doing um, Masters of Business Administration and management training and those sorts of things. And that was, you know, I found it personally beneficial um, and was very good for my career, but I think it also was good because I think at that time there was a perception, right or wrong, that librarians weren't very good managers. And so, you know, quite a number of us um, went and got those qualifications and, and learned more of those skills. And then I remember having a conversation uh, with Hero McDonald, who some of you may know is a very new university librarian at uh, Deakin University now. And she worked with me at the University of Melbourne in the past. And I remember having this same sort of conversation with her and at that stage, I sort of agreed with her that having more knowledge and doing courses in IT type areas was perhaps more useful. Um, now, again, I haven't had continued that conversation with Hero and I don't know whether she, she thinks that she did the right thing or not. Um, but, you know, I think these sort of waves change in what you might do in addition to formal library change uh, of study, sorry. Um, and I'm sorry, I just remembered there was a question about specialisation, which was part of one of those earlier questions. And again, this is a really hard one because particularly in places where I've worked, I've always encouraged and really gained benefit from having staff who are experts in some of those subject areas. And so, you know, for example, law librarians who have law qualifications. Um, you know, I've had uh, colleagues who have had geology, earth sciences degrees who, you know, work in those areas, um, particularly, um, you know, areas like music it's really, um, really, really helpful to have people with those skills. Now, there's some really good opportunities, I suppose, for people with those um, really specific expertise to be promoted and to play a, an important role in those areas. But unfortunately, in your career, you quite often then to go further, you sort of almost have to leave behind that speciality because if you move into more management roles uh, or broader responsibilities, uh, it doesn't always work that way. Um, but I, I, I think um, expertise is important, but it also, I think we've also learned over time that you can't just have a single um, single person that is the only person that has that expertise or knowledge. You know, librarians have been very good at sharing knowledge in teams and building teams 
where, you know, if someone's away, other people can back them up. And, you know, as we've seen over time, uh, trend in just about all university libraries to, you know, to work in teams and perhaps not just work with, you know, um, uh, academics in a specific area, but to be able to respond to, you know, whole faculties or, or whatever um, is also, um, you know, balancing against that expertise. Okay. I think this might be the last question. Um, students tend to use social media, for example, TikTok frequently. How does your library engage us with users in this space? Well, I think the most important thing is while I, I do use some social media, um, it's much better to have staff members who are, um, you know, proficient in those, um, those apps, um, you know, working in those spaces. And that's why quite often, you know, in the, that student experience area, people that are pushing out um, comms through, you um, I don't know that we do that we use TikTok at Sydney, um, but we certainly use other social media. And uh, yeah, so I would um, advocate um, having staff with those skills to use them. And I mean, this is where we have some um, some amazing uh, people that are PhD students who work for the library. Uh, who are, you know, very in tune with other students. And uh, we rely very much on their intelligence and their expertise. Well, one more question just popped up. One concern with the recent wave of voluntary redundancies was that a lot of institutional knowledge was leaving all at once. So how do you handle that transfer of knowledge? Yeah. Again, um, an important question and, and something that has to be managed um, carefully. I mean, from what I understand, and certainly I know um, people that have left or moved on or whatever, um, we have really good um, documentation processes and handover processes. Um, I haven't seen this working at the more junior levels um, within the staff, but uh, I've certainly seen very uh, good documentation and, and obviously with, with technology and the fact that most of us have, um, you know, electronic file keeping and, you know, we all have things like um, checklists and those sort of things to remind us what you have to do and what the steps are and that, you know, we have a lot of processes, things like running a welcome week or whatever. Um, you know, there's a map how to do that, and they those sort of things can be passed on. But um, yes, of course, um, you know, some institutional knowledge is lost. Um, however, you know, there's also opportunities for other staff to learn some of those things, uh, you know, through doing it themselves. And they're actually creating new institutional knowledge. And, you know, not all corporate knowledge is, is necessary for the future also, because things change and adapt, so. All right, the next question is, what measures have um, you taken to enhance the user's research output? Uh, I think this is probably a question about academics, research outputs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, it differs from university to university and where some of these um, functions sit. And some of these things uh, sometimes sit in the libraries and sometimes uh, they sit in, in other areas, uh, particularly in research office, et cetera. Um, but some of the uh, work that my um, clever colleagues here at Sydney have done, and obviously similar being done elsewhere in other university libraries, um, has been really to help academics look through all their publications. I, I keep remembering publications that I did years ago, and you know I've forgotten to keep records of them and, and whatever. And that's what librarians are really good at, at you know ferreting out all that. 
and it's a lot easier these days. Um, and obviously, even just helping, you know, really amazing initiatives through um, academic libraries across Australia and uh, and Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, over the last couple of years has been, you know, implementing ORCID identifiers so that we can easily trace things. But you know, it's been really exciting where some of my staff have actually worked. We, we work very much with the research um, division of the university. And on the one hand, we do work for individual academics, but we're also trying to target um, particular areas or teams that the university um, believes will be uh, bring in, you know, great research uh, into the future and, and uh, grow some of these researchers. And so, you know, we've been targeting uh, with, with the advice of, you know, faculties and the research office, um, individuals that have been near misses on grants, uh, individuals who, you know, their fellowships that, um, you know, that they've applied for, and not been successful, but uh, through library help and looking at their CVs, finding other publications, tidying it all up, making it look really professional and helping those people. Um, we've had some amazing success. And I, it's so great when I get yet another email from, you know, on the one, you know, you get the announcement from the university how you know, proud we are of these very famous researchers and the awards and grants that they've won. And then in the next day or so, my staff send me an email and say, you know, one, three, five and seven on the list were people that we worked with and helped get them across the line. And that, that, that makes me feel really great. Yes, no more questions coming in. Um, um, so I'm just going to give it one more minute, but we really utilized the full 60 minutes well. So I'm just going to remind everyone that you will have a copy of the slides that is being presented and a link um, to the recording and the contact uh, for Philip Kent so that you can email him if you have any more questions after this session. And there is a short um, survey in the email that I encourage all of you um, to participate where you will be able to feedback what other topics that you would like to see coming out of this series. And of course, if you yourself would like to share your knowledge with the community, please um, self-nominate yourself. Or if you know a colleague uh, who is very good at this, you know, nominate that person and we will be in touch with that certain librarian shortly. Um, so there's no more questions. So I'll thank, uh, I'll thank Philip again for uh, joining us in this series. And then I hope to see all of you again in the May sessions. And then have a very good afternoon and evening. Right? Thank bye you, bye everyone. everyone. Bye.